Mayor Lori Lightfoot is facing pushback from Chicago's police unions and the outgoing city watchdog. All that and much more in our Spotlight Politics. Joining us now are Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. So, gang, as we heard earlier, Amanda's been reporting on this, Rahm Emanuel had his hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to become President Biden's ambassador to Japan. Take a look at some of what he said today. I said then, I'm the mayor and I'm responsible and accountable for fixing this so this never happens again. And to be honest, there's not a day or a week that has gone by in the last seven years. I haven't thought about this and thought about the what ifs. So Heather, we know that Rahm Emanuel, former congressman, former White House chief of staff, how much lobbying on Capitol Hill do you think he did uh, to get bipartisan support? Well, it's clear that he was fully prepared to talk about the mur police murder of Laquan McDonald, and he had his papers in a row. He had a letter of support from the city council's Black Caucus and a letter of support from Laquan's great uncle, Marvin Hunter. Uh, he, it, there is no doubt that he is calling in a lot of favors um, and relying on those relationships. Uh, it did not go unnoticed that uh, Senator Chris Coons, who is the senator from Connecticut, uh, Rahm Emanuel thanked him for reaching out to his son, Zach Emanuel, while Zach was stationed in Korea. He is now a naval intelligence officer, and he was sitting in his dress blues right over Rahm Emanuel's shoulder. So true to the former mayor, nothing, or at least nothing he could control, was left to chance today. And Paris, you know, is he even qualified to be the ambassador to Japan? Well, I, these ambassadorships tend to go to political supporters or financial donors uh, to the president, uh, and Japan doesn't seem to me to be the toughest assignment because it's a longtime ally. I think China would probably be a lot tougher, a geopolitical foe. And as Durbin said, well, if you can manage all the things that are coming at you as mayor of Chicago, you can probably manage this position as ambassador. Uh, Amanda, is this a done deal uh, for, for Rom in spite of the outcry from activists and even some, uh, some, some Democrats? Well, yeah, I mean, activists say that even if Emmanuel does get this position, they are not going to let up their criticism of him. Despite that, it does seem as if at least the senators on the U.S. Foreign Relations Committee are quite eager for him to be the ambassador. It is a post that has been vacant for a couple of years. This is Biden's pick for it, so, um, and, and further, as Heather sort of noted, he has all these relationships in Washington, having served as chief of staff and aide to um, President Clinton as well, and a congressperson himself. So he's sort of one of these peers. There might, however, be one hold up, and that's not because of anything having to do with Laquan McDonald, and that is because Republican U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, using his position on the Foreign Relations Committee to hold back a bunch of diplomatic posts over some other foreign policy arguments with the Biden administration and also really to make a name for himself as Cruz perhaps is eyeing his own political future, really wanting to be a thorn in Biden's side. Okay, aren't they all eyeing their own political future? Um, so moving on, uh, the Chicago Police Union President John Catanzara back in court today over Mayor Lightfoot's vaccine mandate for all police officers. Here's what Chicago Police Superintendent David Brown had to say just yesterday. We're sworn to protect these people in the community. It will go against our oath to take this virus into their homes. They're calling us, you know, in distress. So, uh, Amanda, clearly the brass supporting the rank and file getting vaccinated, but weren't the FOP in the city? They were just in court last week uh, and they were uh, again in court today. But, but what's going on today? So again, in court today, as was reported earlier in the program, this is over sort of the, the muzzling of FOP President John Catanzara, who the city is displeased, is encouraging officers to not comply with the requirement and not even to report their vaccination status to the city. And so uh, and now, in fact, the city actually wanting to expand that. So not just Catanzara, but so the other FOP officers couldn't do that. You heard from the police chief chief yesterday that he believes officers are getting false information from the union that he says should be protecting them. But by the way, going to be back in court again tomorrow on a separate matter. And this is the really sort of more at the, the heart of things. And this is that the police union says the mandate should not be allowed 
to go through because anything like this, it is a matter of employment and therefore should be subject to collective bargaining. So another court hearing tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. The FOP versus the city. That is the, the countersuit that the FOP has against the city that's in court tomorrow. Amanda, you reported that 21 cops, though, were refusing the vaccine mandate. Does that fall short of what Catanzara was predicting? Well, it's still pretty early to measure because they have to go through a lot in order to actually be put on that status where they are not paid and they're stripped of police powers. Uh, as the superintendent of police described it, you have to, you know, go through an initial meeting and then you go through with HR and then you have another one where you're actually given the direct order by a supervisor. And that's when it's officially insubordination and the, the consequences come. And, uh, uh, Brown says that there are some officers that have changed their mind midway through that process. Um, and he says that right now there has not been an issue with not enough officers on the streets. But clearly this is something that is a matter of concern, given that you had the city and the state asking these suburban departments to be there just in case. So there, the, the police department really still going through all of the officers who have not yet submitted their status to the state. It, it's too early really to tell where this is going to go but that suburban issue is one that i think has really caught the the ire and those that are upset with the city for mandates are, are, are really holding on strongly to that and saying that this is a sign the and, city's weak and paris you know give us sort of a, a five thousand foot view of, of what's actually going on here well there's just so much bluster and there's just so much hot air and political posturing and if you go back to the beginning you know i, I talked to a few rank and file police officers that say it wasn't the mandate or the portal it's it's that they felt the mayor went um, to the media and announced this policy before she sat down and negotiated with the union, which is the subject of that court hearing, as we heard. But then, you know, so there's this feeling of disrespect from the mayor, which, and we know that runs deep between the police officers and, and the mayor. And the FOP president, Catanzara, takes advantage of that and puts on a show, does uh, videos on YouTube, says, hold the line, don't comply, uses crazy hyperbole, and then they're countersuing each other. They're going on cable news. Uh, and, you know, to highlight the opportunism here, uh, one of Catanzara's latest videos, he holds up a sign that says Catanzara for Mayor 2023, appearing to, you know, utilize the, the issue here to launch uh, a political career. So when you get rid of all that smoke and all the political posturing, there was negotiation eventually. I mean, the mayor backed off of the mandate. It's not a vaccine mandate. You just have to upload your status for, at this point to a portal. So does anyone really trust these two leaders to to come to some kind of conclusion here without all the bluster and, and the hot air? I don't know. And Heather, we know that New York Mayor Bill de Blasio is following Mayor Lightfoot's lead, uh, surprising with their, their own mandate in New York. Is that surprising or do you think it strengthens uh, Lightfoot's case here? Well, Lightfoot wasn't the first. Uh, police officers in California and Seattle, Washington are also under a mandate to get vaccinated. So I think that the, you will see this across the country. We also had the Supreme Court this week uphold Maine's order that healthcare workers be vaccinated. And I think it shows you that these vaccine mandates are on pretty firm legal ground, no matter what the FOP says in those YouTube videos. And I know the mayor feels very confident confident that she's on clear legal ground, even though she did definitely, as Paris step, say, step back from that October 15th deadline that she set back in August. So we know lawmakers back in Springfield to hash out new congressional maps uh, or a new congressional map, uh, which both the GOP and some Democrats are disliking. So, Amanda, Republicans are against the mapping process. They say that they have been left out. But why are the Democrats upset? Didn't the Democrats draw the new congressional map? Yeah, Democrats most certainly had a say, including Democratic members of Congress who talked with the state Democrats, the legislators who are in charge of passing these maps right now. There's some frustration in terms of not enough Latino representation is the thought, or at least a district drawn to that advantage. And then also particularly in, uh, for example, uh, Dem the, 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 the uh, freshman Congresswoman Marie Newman upset that her district now includes a lot of rural areas Areas instead of some of the southwestern suburbs and that constituents also say is difficult because of the representation concerns of how very different those sort of communities are 
Word of caution, however, this is just a first draft of the maps. We're going to see another version. Not going to say that everybody's going to love that either. There's a lot of competing interests, and of course, Illinois is losing a seat, but this isn't the final map, so we'll hear a whole new round of reaction. <laughs> okay, so Heather, there's the state legislative district map that was signed uh, by the governor using the latest census figures, um, but it faces some legal challenges as well. This is, again, the state map, uh, particularly by the NAACP, but Heather, on, on what basis here? Well, so the state has to follow the Voting Rights Act, which requires that districts be compact and that they do not dilute the voting ability of Black and Latino residents. So the challenge that the state map, which is for state House seats and state Senate seats, is that it dilutes the power specifically of Black voters and Latino voters. It's also being, there's also a, a challenge brought by MALDEF. And so the Democrats are going to have to prove to this judge that they did the best that they could could and that they are in compliance with the Voting Rights Act. And whether it is, it's very much yet to be seen. Okay, so uh, back to some other city news. Now that Chicago's former watchdog, Joe Ferguson, has stepped down from his position, he's had a lot to say, calling Lightfoot's administration, quote, lacking in core competencies. Take a look at what they both had to say this week. I wasn't talking about the mayor. I was talking about the people around the mayor. I was talking about what the, peop what, what, what the mayor arrays around her in terms of the sufficient knowledge, wisdom, expertise. What we're focused on is making sure that we get a new, strong, independent inspector general who understands uh, the importance of staying in their lane. Staying in their lane in Paris. We, hear, oof, we heard yeah. that sound earlier when someone mentioned his name and the mayor didn't know uh, who the reporter was talking about. So Paris, uh, is calling Lightfoot's administration, quote, lacking in core competencies? Is that a nice way to say that the folks in her administration have been incompetent? No, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I think it's very clear uh, how Ferguson, the outgoing IG, feels, and he even said he, he feels the mayor did not live up to her campaign promises to be ethical and transparent. It's gone in the other direction. But I want to take a step back here. I'm old enough to remember when the IG's office didn't really have much teeth, and Joe Ferguson came in in 2009, and if you look at the next 12 years, the breadth and the scope of what they've investigated and audited is it's pretty staggering. Everything from the CPD response to Laquan McDonald, aldermanic corruption, all the way down to tree trimming and garbage collection and how to do that more efficiently for taxpayers. And Ferguson himself was shrewd in, in working behind the scenes over the years to get that office the power to oversee city council. They fought him on that. So it's become an enormously consequential check and balance on city government. And the thought that the mayor and city council wouldn't continue that independence and ambition going forward is unthinkable. I mean, we know things can get out of hand in city government pretty quickly. So it's very important that that office continue uh, the momentum it's had uh, under Ferguson and the staff that works there. Yeah, of course, and you know, all eyes on the on City Hall as we watch to see who uh, fills that position now that Joe Ferguson is gone. That's Spotlight, Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. Thanks, team.